Alrighty, number two. Welcome back to the beautiful forest in Damasuka, Annapolis, Missouri. It was recently, up until yesterday, I was in a really excellent, really excellent 10 day silent meditation retreat here. Really, really grateful to have connected with meditation in general in life and to connect with places like this and, and specifically to connect with this in this specific practice. So coming back to psychedelics, talking a little bit about the history and the science to the best of my knowledge. So history wise, these substances, the natural growing ones, and there are many, many, many substances. So there are mushrooms we've heard of, there is uh, the root bark of shrubs. There's ayahuasca, as many people have heard of, which is actually two different, generally, it's, it's two different ingredients, generally like two different types of vines, but there are, are different plants in, in the jungle that can be combined to make this. And so ayahuasca is a great example of history of psychedelics. Ayahuasca has been around in the Amazon for who knows how long, you know, since before recorded history. And this is a, this is something, it's not just like picking up a mushroom. It's literally either one of these two ingredients. If you ingest it, you will not have a psychedelic experience. But when you combine them together, in appropriate way, cooking them, mixing them, doing appropriate steps, then the one of them will mitigate the different enzymes and processes in the body that would break down the other one. And so then you subsequently have a psychedelic experience. And we're talking about two different plants out of the, uh, you know, how many plants are in a jungle in the Amazon? I mean, hundreds of thousands more, I <laughs> mean, like, you know, to think about that that these people were able to to find that and so that goes with with what many of these indigenous cultures who have been using them for thousands and thousands of years there are okay there's a lot of spider webs right around here as well there are prehistoric figurines or carvings or wall paintings or all different sorts of things demonstrating what is currently believed to be the use of these different sorts of psychedelics whether they're smoked or ingested eaten you know drank uh, prepared in certain ways these things have been around for a really long time and they've been discussed in most every culture that we're aware of you know the ancient greeks discussed them the ancient indians thousands of years before the ancient greeks discussed them egyptians south america north america the native americans the in in russia all over these substances exist maybe the secretions from a toad or from a frog there are you know animals and creatures that live in water. There are, like I said, mushrooms, plants, fungi, different types of fungus, all different sorts of things, seeds. They all have these different sorts of psychedelic properties. And so with that it means there's a wide variety of experience. So when we say psychedelic, it, it's a really a very general term. There are all different sorts of things that, that fall un, into that. For the most part, psychedelics, as far as physically, are not harmful, to the best of my knowledge. Now, there are certain ones that stand out. Iboga, which is the root bark of a shrub in certain small part of the continent of Africa, that one can impact the heart. And so that one, there, there can be danger. And um, there are certain, like ayahuasca and other ones which are called, 
they 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 can be dangerous if you're taking something like an SSRI because they work on the serotonin receptors in the brain and so they can affect that in ways where they're already being affected by the pharmaceutical SSRI that can cause danger or health harm or, or even death those are possible but things like mushrooms or LSD or peyote or San Pedro or DMT well DMT goes with ayahuasca <laughs> um, these sorts of things to the best of my knowledge you know and there's been many many studies on them as far as like actual physical danger it's it's little to none uh, it's certainly nowhere near the effect that occurs with alcohol or smoking, how they affect the cells. So these substances have been utilized by indigenous cultures all over the world for thousands of years. And then in, in modern day, people began exploring in the earlier 1900s, they connected with mushrooms in, in Mexico and began going down to South America and connecting with these sorts of things. Um, and they began experiencing really interesting benefits, uh, creativity, different sorts of insights about the world and about themselves, recognizing actual like changes in their day-to-day -day way of viewing the world and experiencing the world when they had been feeling you know, depression or negativity or closed mindedness or things like that. And so there was a period where these things were not illegal. And actually, if you're familiar with the substance name LSD, that's a man made substance that was discovered unintentionally by a man named Albert Hoffman. Um, but it has very similar characteristics to something that occurs naturally uh, when you look at the molecular makeup. So LSD, once it was discovered, it was actually put into use by psychologists and psychiatrists around the world and definitely here in the United States. If I remember correctly, I believe it was the actor Cary Grant. It was, it was an actor of his time and I believe it was him. He had I think it's dozens of LSD assisted psychotherapy sessions and, and really experienced benefit from it. And there were many people, there were many psychologists who began using it because they were seeing like real long term shifts where they're not just continually having talk therapy that's lasting for years and years. They're actually assisting their patients with moving beyond these challenges that they've had many of them for many years, they're able to move beyond them and to, to heal from them and move forward. So there was lots of really big interest in it. And subsequently, before they were made illegal, there were several thousand studies that were done from all different sorts in places like Harvard. You know, Harvard, as I mentioned, is where Timothy Leary was. And he was part of, if I remember correctly, I haven't been deep in the psychedelic world, you know, for a few years, so a lot of this is off of past memory. So if I, I may say something that's a bit off as far as dates or specific types or names or whatever, you know, if I do, say la vie. <laughs> uh, but he had connected with LSD through working with the United States government because the United States government was doing lots of research with it. Uh, in the military, in the CIA, and also, you know, for things like we're talking about right now with psychotherapy. So that's how he actually connected with it. And once he began experiencing the benefit with it, both in him, is himself, as well as in the patients and people that they were studying and doing studies in prisons and experiencing like all of these really incredible shifts with people like, you know, that would otherwise have been written off as quote unquote hardened criminals or whatever, just really incredible things. Then he felt this should be available and accessible to the public. And so, well, I, I won't speak for what he thought, you know, but in one way or another, it, it began getting out to the public and then it began being spread uh, in the 60s and the 70s and then 
there was lots of fear there 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 it was being utilized you know not necessarily in the most conscious and intentional manners uh there were people who have real challenges with it as i mentioned before when you're working with the psyche with the mind and these things can take you to places that are incredibly deep and when done in intentional ways they can be very healing and wonderful and positive, but when done unconsciously or unintentionally or, or in really challenging environments or have something happen like you're doing it and then, you know, the police come up and, you know, the mind really has a lot of fear or something, then that can cause real psychological challenges that these people experience for a long time. So there was that, and there also was the fact that in my experience and the experience of millions of other people, including many studies, when you ingest these sorts of substances, one of the side effects from them that pretty much always happens in some way is that you begin to feel more connection to others. To whatever is outside of you you begin to feel more love and compassion and connection to not just other humans but that definitely occurs but also to nature to animals to things and so you're not as comfortable living in the unconscious more self-focused destructive ways that may have been living before and so subsequently not as comfortable with things like that can seem like that, such as pollution or overconsumption or creating industries that prioritize making money over, you know, polluting and harming the environment or producing products that are harmful to others or cause addiction or wars or, you know, just things like aggression and violence and control in general. You're not, you can, you see things in a different way and you're not as comfortable with that and so that's one of the things that as we know in the united states in the 60s and around the world not just due to psychedelics but psychedelics played a real role in that and so as can happen in my opinion in the opinion of many others who have studied it much deeper than i the status quo that was in power at that time, which is governments, which is industries, which is, you know, those sorts of paradigms, they felt threatened by it, consciously or unconsciously, is change in what is like the most classic thing in whether it's in the microcosm of your own life or it's in the macrocosm of a society or something where fear rises up and with fear often for many people comes an subsequently anger and aggression and that's change the unknown the uncertain and so there was lots of unknown occurring when all of a sudden this generation of younger people were acting in ways that was very different from before. They were saying, no, we're not interested in working a nine to five. We're not interested in raising our children in these institutions that are training them to be working a nine to five. We're not interested in, in being a part of this overconsumption culture, which we don't feel fulfillment for. And we're told to just continue spending money on things that we don't really want, you know? We're not interested in, in like, going to other places around the world and saying, I know what's better for you in your country than you do. And there, if you don't listen to me, we're going to kill you. We're not interested in that stuff. And so there was lots of fear that arose. And, and one of the s subsequent effects of that was that these substances became illegal. Not all of them, because as I said, there are many, many, many of these. And so the main ones that were popular or common or well known at the time, they became illegal. They are still, they're still illegal in the United States. So as, as you may have heard, there are different cities and there are different states that are decriminalizing, which doesn't mean that makes them legal. It means that basically they won't, yeah, I won't even go into this. It doesn't mean that they're legal. It means that you're not really going to get put in prison for it. 
uh, but it, you can still, there are still repercussions for it, but they're moving in this direction now of decriminalizing, but they are still for the most part illegal. There are, there are other countries around the world where they're not illegal, and then there are also other substances in the United States that are not illegal. There are many substances that are psychedelic in the United States and other places that are not illegal, because as I said, there's many. So that is a little bit of the history up to the 90s where they were illegal. So all of these psychologists, all of the scientific studies that were being done on them, they were all closed immediately because everything became illegal. And there were certain groups of people that continued assisting people with therapy underground at the risk of, you know, getting in trouble, but they they were psychologists and people who had seen this great benefit of helping people and they said we're not going to stop and so they continued there were people such as a man named stan groff s-t-a-n space g-r-o-f where he had seen the great benefit of these substances and he and his wife had seen but they wanted to continue in a legal way so they explored different things and they rediscovered this certain type of breathing where they would do it together in large groups and they would help people breathe, have people breathe in these certain ways and they would experience these sorts of states. And then there were people who just stopped but they tried the legal route and one of those groups is named MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And I believe in the 90s is when they began. And they began working with the government through the government, you know, processes and, and bureaucratic processes to attempt to get these de taken off the illegal and made legal again for use. And so MAPS is one of the main groups behind what we're currently experiencing in the United States and subsequently around the world, which is several of these substances going through trials with the FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, to be viewed as, I won't say a pharmaceutical, but in the similar sort of way to help people with treatment-resistant depression, to help them with PTSD, to help people who are near to death. And so again, in the United States and around the world, really top-shelf education places such a, and, and medical places such as Johns Hopkins University and the Imperial College of London and Yale University in different places. They've been doing psychedelic studies and research now for decades and they've gotten to the place where there are several of these substances going through the FDA trials and they are potentially a few years away from being regulated as in the same sort of way that a pharmaceutical would be regulated, but at least being legal to be able to be used for assistance in these, in these different sorts of areas. So next I will talk about yeah, some of the benefits. Let me think first. History. Any more history on these substances? I mean, there's tons of history, you know. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I think, I think next I'll talk about some of the benefits, and both in general and also that I've experienced in my life. And not just the benefits, but actually what's happening in these sorts of experiences. If you've not had one before, try and give you more insight into like what's actually happening. Because what's happening is probably very much unlike anything you've ever experienced before in your life or even contemplated being possible to experience. <laughs> It's amazing. Mm -hmm.